This is Dr. Lisa Marie Bobby, and you're listening to the Love, Happiness, and Success Podcast. I hope that our few remaining friends give up on trying to save us. I hope we come up with a fail-safe plot to piss off the dumb few that forgave us. I hope the fences we mended fall down beneath their own weight, and I hope we hang on past the last exit. I hope it's already too late. What we're listening to together right now is a cover of the awesome Mountain Goat song called No Children. The artist is Acacia Sears, and she has such a nice spin on the song. I thought I'd share it, and also that it was the perfect song to intro our topic today, because today we are talking about serious stuff, serious stuff. we, We have arrived in January, and What I have certainly noticed through the years is that there's a big uptick in people whose relationships are like seriously on the brink in January and have come to find out that this isn't just me. This is a thing. I was messing around online yesterday and noticed an article that today... January 6th is when I am releasing this podcast. It is divorce day. Did not even know that was a thing, but it makes perfect sense because a lot of couples file for divorce in January and also in August, interestingly. And so every year what I've been trying to do is throw something in front of you guys if if you're on the, the road to divorce just to you know, if not fix everything, at least offer some different ideas and slow this down just a little bit so that you have everything you need. And if ultimately it is the right thing to move through with a divorce, Godspeed. I have I have things to help you with that part too. But you know, one thing that I've noticed over the years as a marriage counselor is that, you know, some couples, they move towards divorce because either they don't know how to resolve the issues in their relationship or they have lost hope that it could ever be different they have tried everything that they know how to do they feel like they've they've done their very best and it's just not changing um and and or such regrettable things have happened that it's really like broken their their trust damaged their bond and it feels impossible to heal and grow back together again sometimes that is in fact the reality and you know we could talk about that too it is also true and i have personally participated in these kinds of situations that that couples who kind of walk up to the brink of this and get real and effective help for figuring out you know how to do things differently how to heal the ruptures they are actually able to not just with draw back from a crisis but but move into a chapter of growth and healing for their relationship where they are actually able to not just resolve old problems but create a different kind of relationship where it is actually actually stronger and happier than it ever was. You know that crisis can lead to divorce, but it can really also lead to an enormous level of healing and new understanding where people start talking about things they never talked about before and have a a much uh, deeper appreciation for each other, a renewed commitment to doing things differently. And it, it can be in some ways the best thing that ever happened for a couple. Again, not always, but, but, not infrequently either. And so with that in mind, I have a number of things prepared for you today. One of the things is something pretty unique. I had the opportunity to connect with author Jim Sexton, who is a divorce lawyer who has written a relationship book, like relationship advice from a divorce lawyer about his observations over the years about what kinds of mistakes he sees couples making that lead them to wind up 
in his office, and also a lot of neat insight onto how to head this off. You know, ideally prevent issues before they they come up, but we're also talking about, you know, the, the path to patching this back together again if if the, the willingness is there. So I hope that this conversation with Jim Sexton helps you if you're in a bit of a relationship crisis. And also, I'll just tell you in advance, just in case you don't make it all the way to the end, where I'm going to be sharing some other resources with you. But, um, you know, one one of the, the biggest, most important things that you can do at, at any stage of, of a relationship, but certainly when relationships start to feel hard, and particularly when someone has thrown down the gauntlet of divorce, is to start a really meaningful conversation that goes differently than your other conversations can. And so um, I have created other resources for you on this topic over the years. You'll want to look up a podcast that I did a while back called How to Stop a Divorce and Save Your Marriage for a lot more specific details. Um, But also just consider that if your spouse has told you that they want a divorce, sometimes that is the end. Sometimes it can be a new beginning, but only if it opens up a new conversation and where you can listen to them without it turning into an argument um, and, and help them experience you in a different way so that maybe they will feel a little bit more hopeful. So that is one strategy, a tool that I have for you that could help you with this, if if this makes sense for you. We have developed a online relationship quiz called How Healthy Is Your Relationship? You can track it down on our website at growingself.com or you can simply text 345-345 and then type in REL quiz, R-E-L-Q-U-I-Z, all one word, and it will send you the link to take this quiz. Uh, it will ask you a bunch of questions to help you um, get a, a sense of how healthy your relationship is, what are the relationship's strengths, and also what the relationship's growth opportunities are. And it also has this little thing where you can send it to your partner and invite them to take the quiz too. And sometimes when couples do this together, if they do it with the intention of, you know, just understanding each other better and using it as an opportunity for growth, it can launch a really powerful conversation around how are we doing right now? How are you feeling? How am I feeling? How is this going for both of us? And what do we each need to be doing to make this relationship better? Now, one little word of advice here. If your partner is heading out the door, if you could get them to take this relationship quiz with you, I would encourage you to put yourself in the listening position and not attempt to make your needs and rights and feelings known right now. That will come down the line if you guys can work on repairing your relationship. But for the moment, uh, see if you can get them to talk with you about how they're feeling, ask open-ended questions, uh, because that could potentially be a path forward. So the tool we have, REL quiz, text that R-E-L-Q-U-I-Z to 345-345, and also track down the podcast, How to Stop a Divorce and Save Your Marriage. Uh, It should be in the list of episodes wherever you're listening to this right now. Okay, so those are a couple resources for you, and let's talk to Jim Sexton. His book is called How to Stay in Love. It is widely available everywhere. He has been featured on NPR, on Nightline, on in Time Magazine, and now he is here on the Love, Happiness, and Success podcast sharing his really great relationship advice with you. Jim, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Wonderful. Well, I'm so excited to talk with you, not just about your upcoming book, but really the history and life experience that 
that gave you the, the wisdom and insight to write such a book. Would you like to share a little bit of your, your story and how this book came to be? Sure. Yeah. I, I, it's a, you know, it's something I, I, I think people are curious about when they see the book, you know, they, 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 people who are looking for a, a relationship advice book or who are looking, a, a, you know, for some guidance on, on how to stay in, in a state of romantic love. The last person most of them would think to talk to is a divorce lawyer. Um, we're, we're kind of like the, you know, the grim reaper of, of marriages. Mm. And it's, it's really not what you think when you think of true love uh, is a divorce lawyer. We, you know, we, we remind people of, of the opposite, but you know, really, in many ways, the book is a reverse, you know, how-to book. It's a how-not-to book, if anything. And, and it really was born of the fact that for 20 years now, I've been on the front lines of divorce. I'm a, I'm a divorce trial lawyer, and I work in very high-conflict divorces. And, and I also work in very routine, you know, friendly divorces. Um, and, and, you know, I've just watched all varieties of marriages end. I've watched long marriages, short marriages, second marriages, fifth marriages. I've watched, you know, people with an age difference, people with no age difference, people with religious differences, no religious differences. And I've just seen every variety that's out there. And, and, and in that experience, I started to, to just sort of see uh, patterns and see common themes that, that were all present in the people that ended up in the chair across from me. And, uh, you know, I sat down one day and just started writing down some of the things that I saw. And uh, um, thankfully, it, it, it's something that caught some attention. And uh, I, I, I blogged about it for a while. And then it developed into uh, the book uh, that came out last year. If you're in my office, it's already too late, The Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Staying Together. And uh, that was, you know, very well received by the New York Times Book Review and a couple of other you know, uh, uh, key reviewers enjoyed it and, and it led to some other media opportunities, some TV appearances. I had a recurring segment on Steve Harvey's show for um, the last year. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a really interesting and wonderful journey. I'm still a full-time divorce lawyer. I still work in the field and, and uh, I'm still in the trenches, but uh, this is more of a labor of love and something that I, uh, no pun intended, you know, it's a labor of love. It's something I, I enjoy doing Maybe I'm repaying some karmic debt for facilitating the demise of so many marriages, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I very much enjoy, you know, trying to put myself out of business if I can, um, you know, and, and, and see if there's a way for people to, uh, uh, to stay on the path that keeps them out of my office. It's really not designed for people necessarily that are having relationship problems. It's really designed for people who are in new relationships or maybe even looking for a relationship. Um, or in a happy relationship and they want to sustain that happiness. And that's really where my focus is, is, is not about how to fix what's broken necessarily, although I think there is a bit of that in there. Um, it's really about how do we stay, uh, how, do we, how do we not lose the plot of the, of the book we're writing together, you know? I completely get it. I often think, because I'm a, a marriage counselor, that's, that's my sure. number one job. And I so often think to myself, you, you know, especially with some couples, when you hear in their story, if you guys had done something differently, yeah. like three to five years ago, this would have, yeah. a, you wouldn't even be here right now, right? It's a totally different effect. Yeah. 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 My, I, my, mm -hmm. my sister is a dentist and she often tells me that by the time people have a toothache, it's too late. You know, that if they'd seen her oh. for a checkup, you know, a year before that she could have prevented the toothache from ever coming and the, and, and the work that then is going to subsequently be necessary. And I, I think it's the same thing. I mean, I, you know, if people who marry spent an hour or two with a counselor like yourself, or if they spent an hour or two with a divorce lawyer and just understood a little bit better kind of what it is that they're getting into um, and, and what are some common, you know, bumps that they're going to run into and what are some preventative strategies and some proactive things they can do. You know, people generally marry with very good intentions. You know, it's, uh, it's rare that someone gets married as well, I'll just try this and see how it goes. You know, usually it, it really is that they have some intention of staying together and, and, and if it, somehow they just either or both lose the plot. And, and, and that's really what my book is about, is about how to, how to keep things on track, how to not screw it up, how to not, you know, turn into the, the, the pile of misery that, that lands in my office. Amazing. Well, so 
aside from to everyone within the sound of my voice, premarital counseling, right? Um, sure. What are some of the, the things that you see, let's say even a dating couple or a couple who's mm -hmm. getting engaged and they are in that like giddy and in love stage uh, that, but that they might not be thinking about through your eyes, what would you yeah. maybe see that some of those couples well, that's a great, aren't seeing? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, you know, and it's one I haven't really been asked before, but I think it's a great one. Uh, what I'd say is when people are dating and they're considering marriage, right, and I would say the earlier in the relationship, the better, I would ask myself the question, um, is this person, you know, because the job description for a boyfriend or girlfriend and the job description for a spouse can often be quite different. You know, the things that, that would make a great uh, boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, someone that you want to share fun experiences with, um, you know, someone that you want to have, you know, build, build enjoyable memories with and have maybe passionate, great sex with. And, and the kinds of, of resume you might want for a marriage are, are, are a little bit different. You know, one of the one of the analogies I use in the book is that, that if I said to you, um, you, you get to buy one car in your entire life and you have to drive that car for the rest of your life, you, you'd think long and hard about what kind of car to buy because the kind of car that would suit you in your 20s might be a sports car. But when you're 70, you know, getting in a sports car is not going to make sense. Or when you're in your 30s or 40s and you have children, trying to put a, a baby seat in that car is not going to make sense. So I, I think it's the same thing in terms of romantic partners. In a, in a marriage, you're not just um, having a romantic partner, you're having a roommate, um, you're having a travel partner, you're having potentially a, a person you're going to co-parent with, you're having a person that you have, whether you want to or not, um, financial ties to, um, and financial roles and responsibilities with. And, and, and so their habits are very much going to affect you on a day-to-day -day basis. And they may be a wonderful partner in, in one area of life, but they might be really ill-suited to you in another part of life. And I'm not suggesting that it's binary where you're either perfect in all the categories or you, know, you, should, and you, or you should be tossed out. But I think the more we identify a problem, I mean, you know, this is a counselor that, you know, the first step is sort of identifying the problem and acknowledging that it exists. And then you can talk about, you know, solutions or strategies or coping mechanisms. And I think that's really what, what I would say to people who are dating is just try not to let the rose colored glasses of affection and passion, you know, cloud your, your ability to see honestly where there are areas of potential issues. Because, you know, I think having a conversation when you're dating someone about, hey, look, we have some things where we might not do it the same. You know, I, I'm an early riser and you're a night person or I, you know, you keep a OCD clean house and I, I, I'm a little bit messy and scattered. And, and, you know, right now that doesn't bother me. I think it's adorable and it's lovely, but am I going to feel that way 10 years from now if I'm sharing a home with you? And I think that's a really valuable conversation to have as early as possible. Well, and I love that that's kind of your, your number one piece of advice to begin with is just to have open conversations about the differences because most things really can be solvable problems. And you want to hear something so crazy. So here at, at Growing Self, we do, you know, obviously private premarital counseling. We also do a premarital counseling class called Lifetime of Love. Sure. And I have had on several occasions talk to people who are interested in taking the class. And then I'll say things like, well, you know, we also do private premarital counseling. We do like an assessment where we could like kind of look at differences. And mm. you know what their reaction was, Jim? It was, nope. oh no, 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 no. <laughs> that, that might cause nope. problems. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, oh my gosh, really? Yeah, you know, like, we've, we've, got that, we've got that junk drawer in the kitchen, you know, that we yeah. just, I don't know where to put this, so I'll <laughs> throw it in there. And, and I think they're, you know, it's a normal human thing to say, you know what, I don't want to look at that right now. I'd, I'd rather have a nice time and I'd rather, you know, just enjoy the company of this person. But I, I think you're absolutely right that the sooner you look at those things, um, the, better, the better you can develop strategies for them and the better you can develop ways to communicate with them. I, you know, it's very funny. People, one of the most common questions I get when I talk about the book is, or I talk about what I do for a living, is um, what do I see as the real marriage killers? You know, and, and so they say, you know, what are the things that end marriages? Why do people end up in your office? Yes. And I always tell them, well, you know, no, no single raindrop's responsible for the flood. You know, the flood is an affair. 
the flood is financial impropriety. The flood is, you know, these big, huge things that, that happen. But very often, the, 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 the raindrops, you know, that made up the flood, these little disconnections from our partner are the things that lead to those big marriage killers, you know, and, and those, if we can fix those small things and course correct along the way, very often we won't get so far away from our partner that, that we even encounter those big things. You know, I, I found early in my career that the truth was at the bottom of a bottomless pit when you talk about why people's marriages end, because, you know, uh, she would come in and say, you know, oh, well, marriage is ending because he's sleeping with his secretary. And then you'd hear him and he'd say, well, I'm sleeping with my secretary because you haven't been sleeping with me for years. And then she'd say, well, you haven't been I've been sleeping with you for years because you're never kind to me. And, you know, you know, you're never affectionate to me. And he said, well, I'm not affectionate to you because you're always so cold to me. And the next thing you know, it, 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 it just, it spirals down and getting smaller and smaller. And he's constant, slow, steady state of disconnection. And, and that's, Really, you can see a straight line only in reverse. So I, I really do think that, mm. that that's the challenge is, is getting people as soon as possible to just start paying attention to, yeah. to their own behavior in a marriage and their partner's behavior and what it, what it might reflect. That is such great advice. And also in, in the, the little vignette that you shared, I'm just over here nodding my head because as a marriage counselor, I think what, what you're describing is often the, the truth is that people are very focused on their own hurt, you know, the way that right. they have been victimized in this relationship. And until their partner starts being nice, they cannot change. And, and it's very reactive. Active, right. Yeah. And so, and I think, I think what I'm hearing you say in there is in addition to that, just that listening piece, like almost a willingness to take some responsibility for how you might be yeah. impacting the other person. Is that? Yeah. And I, I think we fall in love very quickly and, yeah. and, and then we fall out of love maybe slowly. And, and one of the things I've really observed is that, you know, there, there are all of these small moments in relationships where we have opportunities to show kindness and affection to our partner. And yet it's become in our culture, if you, if you watch sitcoms or, you know, to sort of belittle our partner and, and, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, my pain wife and oh, my idiot husband. And, you know, it's the person we're supposed to kind of roll our eyes at, you know, whereas a, a boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, it's, it's, it's the person that you're, when you're first dating them, everything they do is lovely and wonderful. And, 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 and to the little, you know, idiosyncrasies of their personality are not annoyances. They're just sort of the things that make them them. And I, I really do think that they're, they're those small kindnesses that we show to our partner are the things that really let them know that, you know, we're their cheerleader still and that we're, you know, we're in their corner and that we, we care about them. I, I, I'm always amazed, you know, some of the advice that I give in the book, I, I think is very, very simple kinds of techniques that people can use um, you know, simple things from just leaving a note for your partner in the morning when you leave for work that just says, you know, hey, I hope you have a great day and I'm thinking of you and, you know, thanks for last, you know, dinner last night was great with you or oh, I really enjoyed sitting on the couch watching, you know, TV with you and I'll be thinking of you today. And you know, what does that take? 30 seconds, you know, a minute to leave that note? And, and you know, I've, I've gotten feedback from, from, from people who read the book who said, you know, I started doing the note thing and it's like unbelievable. Like I, I, there's a line between, you know, me leaving a note and me suddenly having a better sex life. And is it really that easy <laughs> that, that we could, but, but it really, yeah. you know, in some ways it is that easy because it's this small sign of affection and attention and mindfulness that reminds this person that you're still here and that you're still in it. And, and, and that, you know, just as those little discourtesies and little annoyances can over a long period of time lead to these large distances between people. Well, the reverse is true also, you know, these little kindnesses and little, you know, little, little acts of love to your partner can also add up and spiral in the same way. So. They absolutely do. And I'm sure you've had people tell you this before, but you know, your, your observations as a divorce lawyer are also borne out by a lot of really good research into couples and, and family therapy about precisely yeah. what you're talking about, that to be yeah. kind and generous and warm right. and loving that those, even though it, it might not feel 
feel like you're doing much in that moment, and it might not always immediately be reciprocated or responded sure. to. It adds sure. up, and and it goes sure. a long way to mend, as you say, the 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 cracks. You know, the the disconnection that can begin to get bigger and yeah. bigger over the years. That's yeah. wonderful advice. Yeah, and I think I. I think mm-hmm. the world, you know, feels antagonistic to so many of us. You know, there, there's, there's so many things out there from, you know, at our employment and in our lives that, that just feel like they're, they're piling on to all of us, you know. And, and I, I really do think that, that ideally your, your, your relationship, your primary romantic relationship, whether it's a marriage or cohabitation or even just dating someone, it, it's in some ways meant to be your shelter from the storm a little bit. And it's meant to be some refuge from that. I'm not suggesting that that's all it should be is sunshine and roses, but I, I think that having some component of that is really, really important. It's what makes a, a, a spouse different than a roommate, you know, is, is that there's a component of affection and love and, 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 and the sexual connection maybe. And, and those are all things that need to be tended to, I think, in mindful ways. And, and when there are problems and disconnections, you know, there's a chapter uh, in the new book called Hit Send Now, where I talk about um, a technique for sending your spouse an email um, when when something has happened in the relationship that's blipped on your emotional radar in a negative way. And I encourage people to do that via email for some very specific reasons that I talk about. But but basically they are that if you start a conversation with your partner, um, you know, it feels confrontational sometimes. They not may not be ready to talk about it. They may be someone that wants to process it a little bit and, and, and hear what you have to say with some precision specificity. I also think when you write things, you, you might be more mindful of what you're saying rather than when you're just rolling with a discussion. So I encourage people to, to, to you know, send an email to their, to their spouse or partner when something's blipped on their emotional radar in a negative way or even in a positive way, but just sort of share your emotional state because it, it gives that person some insight into the map of you. And, 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 you know, sometimes it can really, I think, be a very powerful tool. I've had some people, you know, give me feedback uh, uh, who, who had read the book uh, and, and it said, look, you know, I, I started doing that hit send now email concept and, and it's working for us. You know, like we're, we're kind of misunderstanding each other a little less, you know, because sometimes they are just misunderstandings. And sometimes it may also be that we just didn't, we're reckless with our words and we didn't realize that something we said, you know, hit the other person harder than we intended it to. And, and I think that, that if we can share that, I know that it's very hard in the day to day life of people to, to, you know, to, to, to do this kind of routine maintenance, preventative maintenance on a relationship, but I think it's an investment worth doing. You know. Oh, of course. I mean, gosh, if you're going to take care of anything in your life, why not your marriage, right? I mean, the people get the Absolutely. oil on their car changed more often than they do maintenance yeah. on the most important Well, I think people give, more thought to, uh, yeah. people give more thought to their cars than they do to their marriage sometimes. I think that, that you know, they, they, uh, marriage is just something that, you know, whoever discovered water, it wasn't a fish. You know, when you're in something, you very often don't, you don't notice it. You know, you sure. don't notice the components of it. You don't see their familiarity sort of, you know, blends and in, into nothingness. So yeah. I think it's, it's good to be mindful of your marriage. And, and, and I think that's the key. I think the people who end up in my office, the most common trait is, you know, that they, they just stopped sharing honestly with the other person, how they were feeling until it, it had reached a point where, you know, they were, they were too far away from each other. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think something goes on, starts to happen mentally, um, where it's almost like people begin to believe that it doesn't matter, that it's not going to change. It's not going to be different. But interestingly, a lot of times they either haven't try to say out loud how they feel or, and I think this really goes back to the point that you were just making about that Mm -hmm. wonderful technique of using the emails, is that sometimes Mm -hmm. communication itself feels so hard. You know, like if someone says, it it hurt my feelings when you X, Y, Z, and then the other person immediately comes back with some kind of defensiveness or or minimization, then it, it, it almost feels worse than the 
date than the event that triggered it, you know? And so what you're talking about with that email technique is wonderful because, you know, the person who's sending it really does have the opportunity to say how they feel without being interrupted, which in and of itself can probably make them feel better. But also have the other person on the other side not get into that really like emotional, defensive, reactive space, but instead maybe think about it a little bit. Um, yeah, and I, I really wonderful. talk about mm-hmm. it as a technique, you know, yeah, as yeah. something that that you discuss with your partner when you're not in a conflict. You know, I, I think we don't have enough conversations about how to have conversations. And I think that, that if we could say to our partner when we're in a good headspace, when we're getting along and things are good, and we say, hey, listen, we're going to at some point ruffle each other's feathers, or we're going to upset each other, or I'm going to say something to you, I guarantee it. I'm going to say something to you that is misinterpreted or that comes out the wrong way. So when that happens, what kind of person are you? Are you the kind of person that needs a minute to just process it? Are you someone that doesn't want to go to bed angry and you want to deal with it right away, right then and there, no matter what, if we got to stay up all night to hash it through? Like, help me understand what works for you in terms of how we communicate, because we're different people. We might communicate differently. And one of the things that I like about the idea of having a technique you know, whether it's on, you know, once a week we go for a walk and talk and we just check in on the relationship. Hey, how do we do this week? You know, how are we doing? Is there anything going on right now that we should talk about? Or is there any, have I done or said anything this week that you really liked or done or said anything this week that you didn't like and check in with each other, you know? And I I think that if we do that as a technique, as a, a mindfulness practice, that the, the worst time to figure out how to have a fight is while you're in a fight. Isn't that you know, the truth? The worst <laughs> time. So why do we wait until then? Like we have affection for each other and we have an abundance of goodwill if we're in a good relationship. If we're thinking about getting married or if we're engaged or if we're newly married, we have decided out of the 7.3 billion people in the world that you, this other person is the one we're signing on for. So I can't think of a better time than at the start of a marriage or right before one to say, hey, while we like each other more than any of the other 7.3 billion people in the world, how, how are we going to do it when we, when we screw it up? Because I'm going to screw it up. I'm mm-hmm. going to tell you right now, I'm going to screw it up at some point. When yeah. I screw it up, how are we going to, how are we going to keep it on track? And that's the time to have that discussion. Absolutely. While you're both still young and cute and in love with each other. Sure. No, sure. that that is a we we have that we're we're like a broken record on on that subject that, that the time to talk and repair a relationship is while it's still good. But I love what you're saying, which is how do we have proactive conversations while we are sane and calm about how we are going to talk about inevitable mm-hmm. conflict and times that we're yeah. each going to mess up or disappoint each other. How should we handle right. that and to have like an action plan for what to do? Yeah. Because it's going to happen. It's totally going to happen. Yeah, and we have to yeah. be prepared also to, mm-hmm. to, 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 to live with whatever it is we propose, you know, which is, you know, we, if we say, okay, look, I, I want you to communicate with me when, when you have something that blips on your emotional radar, then we have to be prepared to listen to, to this person when that happens, you know, and we have to be able to, to be a little reflective and a little less defensive if, if possible. You know, my job is, is really, I'm a weapon, you know, as a divorce lawyer, I'm, I'm something that you point at someone who at some point you loved, or at least claimed to love. And my job is to, you know, to, to advance your interests against theirs. That, that should not be the first time that the two of you are having any, you know, reflective discussion about where there have been problems in your marriage. That's the worst time to pay me $600 an hour to, yeah. to hash out conflicts, you know, because look, you, you know better than anyone as, as, as someone who works in, in couples counseling that, you know, the fight, what the fight purports to be about sometimes is really not what it's about. You know, it's not about you know, uh, what, 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 what road we should take to go visit your sister and which one's faster and which one's slower or what's the best kind of coffee to buy. It's about, you know, feeling disrespected. It's about feeling unheard. It's it's those, those, those conflicts that we think are about the thing we're fighting about are very often about a much deeper kind of meta conflict that's happening, you know, that has to do with how we feel we're perceived or, or loved or lack of love by the other person. And that's, that's where the work is, you know. 
Oh, absolutely. And and I my we're not looking at each other, we're just talking, but my mouth dropped open just a little bit at something that you said a moment ago that that you know the the moment to have these heart to heart like authentic conversations is not in my office. I have to know. Do you ever see that happen? I mean, do you have couples who show up and like the first time they've really talked about how they're feeling? Is in your you know, office? Yeah, I, I'll say this. I, I do. I have people who come in. I, I've seen it in two different ways. One is I have clients who come in and they're telling me the history of the marriage. And I say to them, oh, and what did they say when you told them, you know, that you were upset about? They say, oh, well, they want, then they did this $100,000 renovation on the house and I never thought it was a good idea. And I say, okay, so what, what was their reaction when you told them that? And they say, well, I, I never, you know, told them that. I didn't want to get into it with them. And then I go, okay, well, you know, you never... You know, I'm thinking to myself, you never even gave this person a chance. Like, A, they didn't know your resentment about it. B, you never gave them a chance to kind of pull out of it if, yeah. if they knew how strongly you felt about it. Mm-hmm. So that's one context. And the other is, you know, there, I'm constantly involved in negotiations, you know, of, of, of high conflict divorces and financial issues and custody issues and divorces. And especially in custody issues when people are arguing about the kids, they, they really start venting the frustrations that they've had as parents together. And, and it's really amazing because sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll, they just really have never communicated about the kid. Well, you've never, you know, you never come home to spend time with the kids. And, and why do you want to have them on Wednesday nights now? You never used to spend time with them on Wednesdays. And the other person says, well, you know, I, I, I never spend time with them because every time I'd come home and I'd want to help with the homework, you know, you'd say, oh, it's done already, or I'm going to do it. You don't know how to do it right. And really, it's a conversation about how they should have been communicating with each other while they were trying to co-parent within the relationship. And now they're doing it at a lawyer's negotiating table with two advocates who are paid, you know, hundreds of dollars an hour doing it on their behalf. And that, that strikes me as, look, there's times where that's going to be absolutely necessary, where a marriage is irreparably broken and they're past the point of no return and they need advocates to work with them to try to, you know, to, to hash out the issues and where the potential problems will be. But I, I just have to think sometimes if people, you know, could advocate for themselves while they're married and talk about, hey, you're doing this and it, it makes me feel this way or, hey, you're doing this and it makes me think you don't care about this or that issue when it comes to the kids or when it comes to me. Boy, I, I think that'd be powerful, powerful stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think too for for people to like you said a minute ago, have the opportunity to do something about it before it's too late. Which which also, I mean, it requires being open enough to hear what the other person is saying and and be influenced by that. Um but gosh, you must think to yourself so many times just what what a tragedy it is for the family that those people People weren't able to, you know, before it got mm-hmm. so far. Have you? I have to ask, have you ever had a couple come to you and they're ready to get divorced and they start finally having these kinds of conversations and they decide to give it another no. go? Has that ever happened? You know, I haven't had a situation where I could see a straight line between our discussions at the uh-huh. negotiating table, but I've had a lot of couples that start divorce actions. And in the process of going through the initial phases of the divorce action, and sometimes even late stages of a divorce action, um, they, they start to, to see the other person's point of view better, and they do ultimately reconcile and discontinue the action. I mean, one of the things that happens very often in custody cases is there's a lot of very detailed discussion about the history of each person's parenting and their employment schedules and the way that they impact their parenting. And... You know, sometimes it, it, it really is the first time people have had to put on paper the reality of their parenting or, or, or the lack of their involvement sometimes in their children's lives or, you know, and, 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 and sometimes I think that does inspire people to, to look a little closer at themselves. I also think, you know, the classic concept of we don't know what we've got till it's gone. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I, you know, marriage, you know, the divorce rate is currently about 53%, um, which, which is not a great rate in the scheme of things. I mean, Toyota had a car that had problems with its brake line on 0.0001% of the cars, and they recalled the entire model of the car. That is a um, good point. <laughs> many years ago, because, because, you know, their attitude was, well, that's, you know, it's dangerous, and we don't want anybody to get hurt. Well, 
if I told you there's a 53% chance that when you walk out of the studio today, you're going to get hit in the head with a bowling ball, you know, you, you would either not walk out or you would wear a helmet. So, um, and yet people continue to get married at an alarming rate. And, and uh, even though they know that there's more than a 50% chance that this is ultimately going to lead to, to a failed marriage uh, or, or a broken marriage. So I, I do think that, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the key here is going to be that, you know, people just, again, take seriously the concept of getting married and realize that, you know, you have one set of problems when you're not married and you have a different set of problems when you're married. And sometimes when you're going through the process of divorce, you realize, well, being divorced is not Shangri-La. It's not the grass on the other side of the fence that's greener. It's just a different set of problems. And, and sometimes when you see the different set of problems, you go, well, you know what? I, 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 the set of problems I had when I was married wasn't as bad as I thought it was. You know, and, and, yeah. and so I, I think that that does happen sometimes, but it doesn't happen that often. No, I, I get that, that, that it, it, it feels like it's so far gone by that point. Yeah. But, it, but it's also that there's kind of a, a long exit ramp many times. And mm-hmm. I think it's also interesting that as relationships are beginning to feel more complicated or maybe there is more disconnection, that people can start to handle that in very different ways. And I actually um, found an essay that you wrote for Time Magazine where you talk sure. about the dangers of social media. Would it be okay if I just read a little excerpt to you and then, and then we can discuss sure. because I thought this was sure. so important and interesting. So, so you wrote, from time to time in moments of transient loneliness, do you long for some temporary distraction or brief mental escape from your day-to-day life? Do you think about people you slept with when you were single or people you wanted to sleep with? Wonder what they're doing now? Would you like to peek in, perhaps even anonymous, anonymously, on what those people are doing? Don't kid yourself. You're an idiot if you use Facebook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I stand by that. I just I, I thought that was that. so interesting and insightful. Yeah. And I'm wondering if well, you could the, talk a little bit more about what you what sure. you have seen with regards to that. Yeah, there's a chapter in the book, the new book, uh, that's called "If I Was Inventing an Infidelity Generating Machine, It Would Be Called Facebook." <laughs> and that's perfect. It, it basically talks about in great detail why the specific technology of Facebook is, in my opinion, very antagonistic to marriages. Um, and I, I base that not just on speculation, but on the sheer number of people that come into my office who have had affairs that had their origins in Facebook or have had affairs that were facilitated by the communication uh, uh, methods that are available in Facebook. And I, I, I really have come to the conclusion after looking at all of that, that Facebook can be very toxic to most marriages. You know, when are we on our phones? When are we looking at social media? It's, it's not while we're having great sex or having a delicious meal or enjoying wonderful time. It's when we're bored or we're lonely or we're in some transitory, you know, moment where we're just, you know, sitting around or waiting in the doctor's office or something. It's, it's a moment of boredom. It's a moment of distraction. And so it's not when we're at our peak state and feeling our best self. Well, what is Facebook? Facebook is basically, you know, everyone's presentation of the best parts of their life. It's the best photos of yourself. It's the highlights from your vacation. It's the highlights from your day-to-day life. And so when you're not feeling great, you're watching everyone else's highlight reel. And so, of course, you're going to start to think everybody's happier than you and everyone's doing better than you and everyone's more in love than you. And while you're in this state and while you're so, so frenzied by this, that you're not in your best moment, everybody else appears to be in their best moment, what do you have available? You have messaging devices and encouragement from the technology itself for you to contact people who you went to high school with and college with and who may have, you may have dated in the past, you know, people that you have connection to. Who are you looking up on Facebook? You're looking up your ex-boyfriend, your ex-girlfriend. You're looking up people that you knew when you were younger. 
Um, and, 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 and then you have the ability to message those people privately. You have reasons that, that you can communicate with them that they give you a plausible deniability. It's not like you're logging onto a website that's called, you know, I'd like to have an affair.com or something. You're, <laughs> you're logging onto a very benign technology. Oh, are you going to the reunion next week? Or, oh, wow, you know, I, uh, happy Christmas. I saw the, the picture you posted of your kids. They're so cute. You have lots of reasons to communicate. You know, the soccer mom who's on your son's uh, team. Um, you have a reason to communicate with her via Facebook and, oh, I saw that you went, you know, to the Dominican Republic. I'm thinking about going to sometime. Where did you stay? And meanwhile, you're flipping through the pictures and now you're seeing this person in a bikini. So there's a lot of invitations to, to communications that can very easily be flirtations and very easily ways to get to know a person, again, in a very highlight real way, because that's what we show on Facebook. So I just think that, that um, there's a perfect storm that seems to happen with Facebook. And I've seen it, you know, I've seen it hit people and I've seen it uh, hit a marriage. And, and, and it, 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 it really causes, uh, from what I can tell, a lot of potential problems for people. So the chapter uh, in that book and, and that, that piece I'd written for Time really just talks about why Facebook specifically is, is I think, such a dangerous technology to marriages. It it really is, and and also I think it's it's a, uh, a a choice, you know, that that marriage is difficult, and like what you're saying, to turn towards someone that maybe isn't being that interesting or fun, and have hard conversations that you might rather avoid. That that takes, I think, a lot of courage and a lot mm. of um, almost like wisdom. That that this is this is actually what is required to have a strong, healthy mm. marriage. And I think yeah. what you're saying is so true that it's very easy to instead um, start filling in that distance instead of with something difficult, with something that yeah. feels easy and accessible and fun. And that it is so easy to idealize what other people are, are like or have fun little bantery, flirty conversations with, you know, yeah. someone that you kind of know, as opposed to the grumpy person in the next room, you know, and, and, right, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a, that's a potentially, like I said, that's a, that's a fairly easy tweak. You know, we, we don't have to be on Facebook, you know, or we don't have to use Facebook that way, or at least we can use it mindfully and, and, and think to ourselves, Hey, you know, if I hang around a barbershop long enough, I'm going to get a haircut. Like if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm using this tool to communicate with people, I have to do it in a mindful way. And I have to try to remember that this is their, their greatest hits reel. This is not really their life. Like everyone is not as blissfully happy as they appear on Facebook. One of the things I talk about in the book is how many people, when I look at their social media profile, when they're in my office, you know, a few weeks before they were posting all kinds of lovely things about how great their spouse is. And meanwhile, I know they've been having an affair for the last year and a half, you know, and, and it's, it's really is not an accurate reflection of people's lives. I think, you know, only a child or a fool would think that, that, that the, what they see on Instagram or Facebook of people's lives is anything other than marketing. Um, it's really commercials for our own lives to some degree. And I, I think, if you start believing that the commercials for other people's lives are real, then you're really going to think your life is much worse than everybody else's. Because, uh, it, you know, we know with commercials, like the hamburger doesn't look like that at the restaurant. It looks like that <laughs> in the commercial. Yeah. And, and, and we don't, when we go to the restaurant, say, hey, this hamburger does not look like it did on the commercial where the bun is all fluffy and the meat is all beautiful and juicy. This thing looks like somebody sat on it. Um, we just think, oh, well, yeah, it's a commercial. You know, a commercial is the best looking thing. Like, you know, the beer ads, you know, never show anybody who looks like they've ever had beer in their lives. You know, they're incredibly skinny, gorgeous people. And, you know, I, I, I love, you know, Coca-Cola ads and, and soda ads because they, all the people in them look like they haven't, don't drink, you know, carbonated beverages filled with sugar. They all look like all they do is go to the gym. So I, I, I think reality versus marketing is really, really important. And, and I think we have to start identifying that social media is really little more than personal marketing. I couldn't agree with you more, but you and I, Jim, we, we get, we get the front row seats to the truth, right? I think that, that people, yeah, people tell us things that they might not, not tell their 
their friends even sometimes. So I, I, I hear you. And I think it's a great reminder, mm-hmm. isn't it? it? In a relationship yeah. or not to, to be right. cautious about, about what you see. Well, this is a wonderful discussion. You've shared so many just interesting insights. Do you have any other tips or thoughts to share that we haven't talked about yet that, that might be helpful? Oh, I, actually, you know what? I, I did think of a question. Yeah. This, is, this is kind of going Go back to the beginning a little bit. So one of the things we talked yes. about was, you know, some of the things that couples can do as they are preparing for marriage, you know, things to consider. Mm-hmm. And, and what you're talking about is laying out the, the action plan of like, okay, what do we do? Not, not if, but when this thing starts to go off the rails. Right. I, I am curious to hear your opinion on prenuptial agreements. And the yeah. reason why I ask is with some premarital couples, um, sometimes when one person floats the idea of a prenuptial agreement, it is just devastating for the other sure. person. And it turns into sure. this big gridlock thing where it, you know, one mm-hmm. person now has to have it often, often them and, and yeah. their, their family of origin standing behind them saying, yeah. yes, she needs to yeah. have it. Uh, but the other person, it, it, it feels almost like a um, insurance policy that's kind of betting sure. on the demise of a marriage in a way that doesn't feel good. Yeah. What I mean, you're an attorney, so it probably depends on who, yeah. <laughs> whose attorney you are, yeah. maybe. But what, what sure. are your thoughts about that? So I, I think the first thing that everyone should be mindful of is that all marriages end. They, they either end in death or divorce, but they all end. So, you know, if someone said we should have a will, you wouldn't say, well, isn't it going to make it more likely that we die? Or, um, you know, well, that's, that's very morbid. I don't want to think about that. Yeah. So I I think what you're saying when you have a will is you're not saying, I hope we die, or I think it's likely that we're going to die sometime soon. What you're saying is, I think I am more qualified than the legislature of the state in which I reside to decide what is going to happen when I die with my money. And I think that's a pretty fair statement. I, I, and I think it's the same thing. So decisions are going to be made if you were to end your marriage in something other than death. So if you separate or divorce, which is the only other way to end the marriage than death, is you're, then you're saying, okay, I trust the state legislature to, to decide how we're going to do that. I, I trust them to decide what our kids would need. I trust them to decide what my spouse would need. I trust them to decide how to divide our bank accounts. And I don't know that you should have that much trust necessarily in people you don't know. So that's one thing. The second thing is, I think prenuptial agreements, when they're handled the wrong way, I do a lot of prenups. I probably do six or seven prenups a month. Um, and what I'll say, and a lot more people have them than, than you know, because of course, you post on Facebook and Instagram the pictures of you picking out the cake, but you don't put, you know, post pictures of, of uh, you signing the prenup. Um, yeah, prenups no, not are, so much. They're not filed anywhere. <laughs> They're not public knowledge. So lots of people have prenups that you don't uh, realize they have prenups. But the thing I like about a prenup, not from a divorce lawyer perspective, but from a, uh, a relationship advice perspective, is it's an invitation to a conversation. And it's an invitation to a conversation at a time where you're supposed to like each other again more than any of the other 7.3 billion people in the world, where you're saying, you know what, I really feel the best about you. And that's the time to talk about, hey, look, I hope this doesn't end. I hope it stays together forever. That's why I'm marrying you. But in the event it does, what's it, what should it look like? You know, what are you going to need? What am I going to need? What do you think you're entitled to? What do I think you're entitled to? And what is that a conversation about? It's a conversation about what are our roles in this relationship? What are our obligations? What do we owe each other? in this relationship? What do we expect of each other in this relationship? What, what compensation, in a sense, do we expect? And when I say compensation, I don't mean money. I mean emotional compensation. What validation do we want our partner to give to things? You know, if I'm going to support you financially and you're going to support me emotionally and I feel that that's a fair exchange, that's a very valid thing to say. If I, if I say, hey, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to work and I'm going to pay all the bills and in exchange for that, I, I really want you to be like this kind person that's there for me and maybe that, you know, does more when it comes to the kids or does more when it comes to the house responsibilities. Have that conversation. Have it in advance. Talk about it. You know, and sometimes that's what a prenup is, is a prenup is an opportunity to talk to a person about 
what is it that we're going to need? What is it that we're going to want from each other in this marriage? What would you do potentially in this marriage that to me would be a non-negotiable and would, would end it? Or what are, what are the things that I expect from you in this marriage, whether it continues or whether it ends? And I think the best possible time to have that discussion is, is before you start down the road. So I've had a lot of people that come in for prenups and they, you know, they, you, you hit it on it very well. They're often you know, with their family pushing them behind, you know, saying, hey, you got to go and get a prenup. You got to go and get a prenup. And they say, look, I don't really think I need a prenup. I'm in love. I love this person. I have no intention of, of divorcing them. But, you know, my mom or my dad or my brother is insisting, you know, that I get a prenup. And we have a conversation about legally what happens when you get married, you know, what happens to your rights and your obligations. And, you know, sometimes at the end of that conversation, people often say, okay, I definitely need a prenup. Or they say, you know what, I don't need a prenup, but at least now I know what my rights and obligations were. You know, you buy a house, they give you a late lead paint disclosure, a HUD one that talks all about the mortgage and how much you're going to be paying in interest. You get married, you don't even get a pamphlet. You don't even get like a piece of paper that says, by the way, you just did the most legally significant thing you'll ever do other than dying. You just changed the way that your inheritance rights works. You just changed the way that your property ownership rights work. You just changed fundamentally all kinds of things about your legal status as a human being. And you didn't even know it. And, and that to me is very shocking. So I, I think, like I said, I encourage people to talk about having a prenup, um, even just having understanding that your partner says to you, yeah, I would never want to do a prenup. Well, that, that might be an interesting conversation to have with someone. Really? Why? You know, or you're, I mean, just, just that level of confidence that, that I think the marriage is going to be successful or, well, no, I wouldn't agree to because I think that I would, you'd insist that I get less than I think I'm entitled to. Those are all very valuable conversations to have with someone. They certainly are. And, you know, as you were describing all of this and, and sort of all of the possibilities of a, an actual prenuptial agreement, which is, could really so far go, go so far, I mean, above and beyond just what is usually discussed about family money. But I mean, it is a prenuptial agreement. And, you know, what I hear you saying is that it's really an opportunity to have a much broader conversation about all kinds of expectations and Absolutely. roles and value and certainly conversations that I think are so important about, you know, money generally speaking around how, how do right. we spend our money? Do we have joint money? Right. Do we have separate money? So so right. many opportunities. Well, yeah, I, I think even just basic opportunities about, you know, I, I just think people who are, are considering getting married, the more that you're talking about what your expectations are, the better. You know, I, I think that you enter into marriage in a, in a certain state, you know, you're, 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 you're talking a certain amount, you're engaging in activities together a certain amount, you're having sex a certain amount. And then, you know, time passes and, and those things change. And unless there's been some discussion about, hey, you know, it's changing. Or, hey, I'm, I'm not getting the things that I liked in this relationship or wanted or that made me feel good in this relationship. You know, people don't hear what you don't say very often. And so unless you're going to have very vigilant communication strategies during the marriage, just naturally developing, the best time to have a discussion is when, again, you have this abundance of affection for each other and optimism about the relationship. That's the best time to develop a strategy. More plugs for premarital counseling and early proactive yeah. marriage counseling. Jim, I love it. Thank you. <laughs> but this has been wonderful. You have shared so many just fantastic insights and tips. I, for one, cannot wait to read your book. The book, again, is called If You're In My Office, It's Already Too Late, How to Stay in Love. Did I get that right? Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. Actually, you, the, you kind of brought the two together. The original uh, book, uh, which came out last year in hardcover format, was If You're In My Office, It's Already Too Late, A Divorce Lawyer's Guide to Staying Together. And on December 31st, uh, Henry Holt is re uh, releasing uh, a, a updated paperback version um, in which uh, some of the content has been updated, and it's being released under the title How to Stay in Love. 
um, unlikely uh, mm -hmm. practical wisdom from an unlikely source. And it's uh, mm -hmm. it's really uh, a lot of the same material. So if you if you bought the original book, uh, getting the paperback is going to give you some new additional material. And if you didn't buy the hardcover, I would say to you buy the paperback when it comes out uh, because it's it's sort of a, a more updated version of a lot of the same content. Um, and it's also available on audiobook. Uh, you can get it wherever audiobooks are sold. If you want to listen to me talk for you know eight and a half hours, um, which is is the, the how long it took uh, uh, to record the whole thing. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, I hope it's something that people will enjoy. And uh, I got great feedback on the first book and, and a lot of really wonderful emails and messages from people uh, just sharing the ways that it, it uh, helped their relationship. I had uh, a couple that incorporated some of the things uh, from the book uh, into their wedding vows. And uh, they sent me a video of the vows uh, as they had done them. And, and it's just been, it's been a wonderful ride uh, for someone who spends most of their time uh, working with people who are going through a bad divorce. It's lovely to spend some time uh, in the world of, uh, of trying to help couples. I bet. Well, so, so interesting. And, and just some, some teasers here for anyone interested in the book. Uh, chapters may include reading minds and accepting appearances. Uh, the you, the me, and the we. One of the pillars of marriage is sex, the myth of the perfect parent, intimacy weaponized, parts one and two. I can't wait to get my hands on this. So I'm definitely- I, I hope you'll enjoy it. I, I <laughs> hope you'll enjoy it. I suspect, I suspect you will because I think you and I uh, have a very similar perspective on a lot of these issues where we're encouraging a lot of communication and proactivity. So I think you'll see a lot uh, in there, just perhaps from a, a slightly different point of view, from the point of view of uh, the person who who uh, is there to to, to facilitate uh, the demise of of the unhappy marriages that uh, were not uh, proactive enough to get in there and 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 do some of the hard work uh, that you do uh, with the couples you work with. So I, I think I, I hope you enjoy it, and I, I certainly enjoyed writing it. It was a labor of love, and it was something that I I really uh, I really enjoyed doing. Well, and I enjoyed our conversation today, Jim. Thank you so much. This was really interesting. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure. Come back anytime. I hope the fences we mended fall down beneath their own weight. And I hope we hang on past the last exit. I hope it's already too late. And I hope the junkyard a few blocks from here. Black smoke carries me far away And I never come back to this town again In my life I hope I lie Tell everyone you were a good wife And I hope you die I hope we both die Shaving tomorrow, I hope it bleeds all day long. Our friends say it's darkest before the sun rises. We're pretty sure they're all wrong. I hope it stays dark forever. I hope the worst isn't over. I hope you blink before I do. I hope I never get sober. And I hope when you think of me years down the line. Coming down with me Hand in unlovable hand And I hope you do